Just a second. Let me. There you go. So I'm going to post a link to this Python notebook um, in the chat. And so it's it's a view only link. So what you can do is um, copy it. So you can, if you can see my screen, you go to, what is it, file, save a copy in your drive, um, or you can download it if you have um, like a Python notebook application, um, and then you can uh, follow along with me, or you can just copy and paste the code in whatever you know IDE you're using as we go along. Um, so I'll give a few seconds to get with that. Okay, so I'll just I'll start out with um, just like a really quick um, introduction to put this into context. Uh, so Tellurium is a platform that can be used to model biochemical networks. Um, so there are many type of biochemical networks or biological networks um, going from metabolites, which are very small scale and in terms of time, they're uh, on the terms of seconds, micro milliseconds to um, sorry seconds, all the way up to um, gene and protein translations and interactions, which are minutes to hours. Um, so the reason you might want to model some of these things is to understand these processes better, um, drive experimentation. Um, maybe you want to try to fit some experimental data that you have and you want to figure out um, like what exact mechanism or rate constant is going into that. Um, and it's also becoming exciting for personalized medicine uses. So um, here's a quick little diagram of how uh, Tellurium relates to um, all these other things that we're talking about today. So Tellurium is a Python-based um, platform for modeling uh, biochemical reactions, as I mentioned. Um, the main thing words that I'll throw on today are antimony, which is a language for representing models, and uh, Lib Roadrunner, which is the actual um, simulator that runs underneath Tellurium. So um, Tellurium can be used in a, several different ways. So you can use it with whatever IDE you like using. Um, so Spider, PyCharm, you can also use it in a notebook form, which is what I'm doing today on Google Colab or Jupyter Notebooks. Um, and it also has a um, its own kind of ID, Spider IDE in which Jupyter I mean, Tellurium is built in. And so you can access that via this link if you're interested, which will take you to the uh, docs on the GitHub page that, that explain how to download that Tellurium slash spider uh, on Windows. I think, well, I think it works on these other things too, but I haven't tried. So um, if you don't want to use the spider built in Tellurium, then you can just go to your terminal and type in pip install Tellurium to get this package going. If you're on, if you're uh, working off of a copy of this collab notebook, then you'll do the same thing, but just you'll have a little exc exclamation point um, there first. So um, I'm going to do that here. The queue is just so that it doesn't print out a bunch of um, We just lose Lily. Yeah, I did. Yeah, she just froze. Me too. The, she's obviously in the office. It's the UW Wi Fi, I guess. So, the, yeah, the internet should be okay there. Hello? Hello, yeah. Did you freeze? <laughs> yeah, you're uh, back. Yeah, you know, it seems every time I get on, I plug into the UW Ethernet, and almost every time I'm on a Zoom meeting, it freezes up, and it ends up being better to just use Wi-Fi for some reason. <laughs> no. Okay. Anyway, you were just telling us about exclamation mark pip. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. So that's where I left off. So if you're uh, running this in a Jupiter or on Colab, you'll need an exclamation point before the pip install. Um, after that, uh, you can go to whatever Python environment you're using and import Tellurium as TE or whatever else you want to name it. Um, I'll be doing that here and hope that the internet will work well enough to allow this. It's not looking very promising. <laughs> Setting things up is always slow on, on Colab. It's not found. Yeah. 
Should work though. Okay, it looks like it's going somewhere. Yeah, we used it a lot in class. Yeah, while we're waiting for that, I can say that, you know, we do a couple of classes, uh, modeling classes, and we generally always use CoLab because there's really any installation issues, if any. So it's the class going quickly. Sure. Okay, so uh, I'm going to do a quick intro to antimony here. If you're interested in learning more about antimony, uh, Lucian Smith is going to present directly after this, and he will explain all about other cool things that you can do in antimony. Um, but I'm just going to do the most the simplest possible thing, which is make a model of this reaction right here. Um, so antimony is a human readable text based model definition format. Um, it can convert back and forth to SBML and a few other formats, um, but the, the main benefit and the reason we're using it here is because uh, you can read the model and understand what's going on. So here is a very simple um, antimony string of this conversion of S1 to S2 up here uh, with a rate of K1 and a max mass action rate law. So I will load that into this variable called ant string. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do with Tellurium is the most basic thing, which is to simulate a model. Um, so for that, we're going to load this antimony model um, into a Roadrunner object and then call this command r.simulate. So you can call this without anything in there, and it will work, um, I think, zero to five seconds default. Or you can specify these arguments, which is the the start time, um, the end time, and the number of data points you want simulated. So, um, and then that'll store this uh, time series data in a whatever you assign this variable to. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that now. So we have that simulation. So now we might wanna see what it looks like. Um, so what we can do is call that Roadrunner object um, and put plot here. And again, you can put nothing in this argument and it will do whatever it wants, um, or we can, you can put in a title and X and Y labels uh, and designate your figure size. So um, I guess I already, I guess it loads and then runs everything. So it's spoiling the surprise, but <laughs> you can see here, this is our, um, what happens to our mass action model above over time. So uh, S1 is being converted to S2, which is exactly what we expect because that's what's happening in our model up here. So a few, another thing that we can do with uh, Tellurium is to get and set values um, of the model. And so without editing the antimony string, you might want to try out a different value for the rate constant or the starting concentration of a species, um, or I think that's mostly what you'd want to do. Um, so here I'll, we'll load the model again, um, which really isn't necessary, but I've just been uh, complete here. And then you can call whatever variable you want um, and reassign a number to it. So we're going to look at K1, which was previously one and name, assign this to have a value of five. Um, so whatever whatever the name is of it in the antimony model, you can call it there. So as we had up here, we had S1. So that concentration can be changed by calling r.s1, r.s2, r.k1. So we'll simulate this again, which is that. So as you can see, the rate constant k has changed in the simulation um, compared to earlier. I'll scroll up so you can see. Um, this is when K1 was equal to one, and this is when K1 is equal to five. And so you can see we are on the same time scale. And then this, this conversion from S1 to S2 goes significantly faster as you would expect. So as I mentioned before, you can also change the starting concentration. So we'll change S2 to 10 and do another simulation. So we see here, again, this conversion is taking place, but we all start already with um, 10 you know, units of S2. 
So when you if you're changing things around, um, you can also you can figure out what values you're using by calling these things. So um, at the end of this simulation, the concentration of S2 is about 20, which makes sense because we start it with 10 of S1, 10 of S2, converted all of S1 to S2. And the current value is uh, of K is K1 again. So let's see. So let's see. So we'll load the model and run it as before. So this should look pretty familiar. Um, and now we'll do this, the same thing again. We'll change K5. And so this looks significantly different than before. So what Tellurium will do by default is it will keep running the simulation from where you left off unless you reset it. So what happened here is this time zero is this time 10 because we didn't reset the model in between. We just ran it, changed K5 and ran it again. So the starting in this second case, the starting concentration of S1 was zero um, because it had already been depleted in this first simulation. Um, and so there was not any conversion between S1 and S2. So in order to avoid that, we have this command called reset. So we can reset the model um, back to time zero, essentially. So we'll do that now, reset it, re-simulate it, and now we see what we expect to see, which is this um, adjustment of K1 to 0.5. So if you don't reset the model between changing the parameters, you might see something that you are not expecting or and or did not want. So you'll see here, though, that an interesting thing, though, is with this reset is that, like I said, it mostly just resets it to zero. So even though we changed K1 up here, simulate it, and then reset the model, if we ask it right here, what is the value of K1, um, you'll see that it's still five. So the reset did not change the parameter back to its original value in the antimony string, which was one. If you want to do that, uh, we have this reset all function. So if we call this, we reset the model back to its original state from the antimony model, and we see the simulation exactly as we expect. Um, and if we ask it what is the value of K1, it is back to uh, 1.0. So that is the most the basic thing that you can do with antimony, which is load an antimony model and simulate it and get and set values. Are there any questions at this point? I can just say that the difference between reset and reset all is that reset resets the species and reset all re resets the species and everything else. Um, in this case, we only have species and parameters, so it's resetting the species and the parameters. There's interesting things with the other elements of that you can put in there, like compartments and stuff. But in general, a reset will just reset the, the things that usually vary and reset all resets literally everything, including the things that don't usually vary. Okay, thanks for clarifying. I I was a little, I had to read over the documentation a few times. To <laughs> yeah, like what exactly is going on with these yeah. three different resets? Just a curiosity question about your plotting. Does the legend, is there a smart placement of the legend? Uh, I think that you, I think there's an optional argument that you can put in here for the location of the legend, but otherwise I think it just, yeah, it auto places it wherever it um, works best. Correct me if I'm wrong, someone. Okay, that sounds right. Um. Yeah, <laughs> correct. Yeah. And you can override that if you want. Yeah, under the hood, it's matplotlib. So it's doing the standard thing that matplotlib is doing. Okay, so in this next section, I'll talk about um, something slightly more interesting that can be done with uh, Tellurium, which is parameter scans. Uh, that is recent changing a parameter, uh, re-simulating um, and iterating through this process a number of times to um, see what parameter, the point at which a parameter might change how everything looks or in order to maybe match data. So you can kind of scroll through and get a plot of everything. Um, so the way I'm gonna do this here is with the te.show function and the te.plot array. Um, and so what we're going to do is loop through a simulation and 
add lines to this plot and then without showing it and then once the loop is finished we'll call te.show to show that simulation so in this case for this example here we have the same model as before just loading it for thoroughness of these code boxes um, and we'll vary the concentrate the initial concentration of s1 and see how this affects the time course of s2 so just to go over this quickly for those who maybe don't have as much of a Python background. Um, so this for loop is we're varying the S, this variable S1 concentration in the in range 10. So that means that it will start at zero and go through 10, you know, one, two, three, et cetera. Each time we do this, we'll want to reset the model uh, as was mentioned before. Otherwise we just pick up where we left off. So this is, it's crucial to include this reset in the for loop. Here, uh, we'll set the parameter of S1 to the concentration in that loop, so, in that loop, so one, two, three, four, et cetera. We'll simulate it for zero to 10 seconds with 100 time points. Uh, and here's a new argument I'm introducing here, which is this little brackets here. So what this is telling you, telling the simulator to do is to plot only the time and the concentration of the species S2 as opposed to both S2 and S1. So then we'll add it to the plot. Um, we'll get some labels, get the color to change and uh, run through this and you'll see the following plot. So you can see based on the legend, this is where S1 is zero, nothing happens unsurprisingly, all the way up into um, S2 being nine. Um, so of course nine is, going the fastest because that rate is influenced by the concentration of, sorry, S1. So the, cause the rate law is S1 times K1. Um, okay, I'll go through this. So any questions about the parameter or parameter scanning? I think that shouldn't have been K1 equals, it should have been S1 equals. Yeah, it, it definitely should have been. I... <laughs> we just added that. <laughs> I started with um, Just in the labels thing there. Oh, yeah, there, there we go. go. I started doing S1 or K1, but it wasn't as interesting. As interesting, yeah. There you go. <laughs> there, you go. Look at that. So there you go. There is the correct label. You can see I just changed that right, right here in the labels section. Okay. Um, if there are no questions, I will move on. Um, so, another thing that Telerium enables is um, stochastic simulation. So the simulations that we've done up till this point are deterministic, meaning if I run, as you've seen, if I run these little boxes again, you get exactly the same outcome as before. Uh, sometimes that's what you want. Other times that's not what you want. Uh, you might want to view some of the, you know, more random variation that is present in real chemical reactions. And so uh, Tellurium enables the use of the Gillespie algorithm, uh, which is an, a commonly used algorithm that kind of Cap aims to capture some of the randomness that occurs just in chemical reactions. So right here, you see, instead of calling everything's the same, this is the same model as uh, before, the S1 goes to S2, loading this antimony string. But here is the difference. Um, instead of calling r.simulate, we're gonna call r.gillespie. And it has the same arguments. So that means we're simulating from zero to 10. And then we'll do our same old happy friend r.plot um, with our title, time, and um, labels. So you can see this is like a little different than what we've seen before. So un un these curves aren't straight. They're kind of in um, influenced by the randomness of this process. But they the overall behavior is effectively the same. US1 is getting converted into S2. So as I mentioned, this is stochastic. So if I rerun these same lines of code, um, so these are just copied over from here to here, you get a slightly different um, simulation, but still the overall behavior is the same, which is that S1 is being gradually converted into S2 over this 10 second period. So now we'll look at um, something similar to what we did with the parameter scan. So we're going to do a bunch of these and overlay them in a single plot. So I'll just walk you through the Python just in case. 
So we're going to make an array called results, and that's where we will um, store every the result of every run. Um, we'll just this is just a dummy variable to say do this fifty times. Again, resetting the simulation. This is an important step that you might forget. Um, so it keeps it starts over from the beginning with each loop instead of starting from where it left off. So this is nearly the same code as before, but again, we have this Gillespie um, function instead of simulate. And we run through that and you get a cool uh, plot of these various stochastic simulations um, demonstrating the kind of variance in this conversion. Or, but you can see the average behavior is basically those smooth lines if you were to probably like fit this. Um, are there any questions about that, the stochastic modeling in Tellurium so far? Okay. So those are the main functionalities of Tellurium and cool things that you can do with it. Um, the next sections, I'll just kind of talk about extra little things that you might find useful or want to do with your models. So here I've loaded a little bit of a more complicated model, um, but not very complicated. You're just converting S1 to two, two to three, and then three back to one. So you have a little circle of reactions. Um, we'll load that antimony string, simulate it, and plot it as per usual. So here we have something slightly more interesting. But ultimately, they are reaching a steady state. As you can see here, they're flattened out at the end. Um, so if you want to, you can look at the, get the full stoichiometry matrix of this system. Um, so just with get full stoichiometry matrix. Um, you can also get extract the ODEs, which is what the simulator is using to actually um, make that simulate this model. One thing that I didn't put in here, but I'm going to right now because, oops, where is I? Because it's also useful. Um, is getting the steady state. Um, so as I mentioned, this this goes off to steady state, and you can check that by um, leave it this. Let's see. No, that's not it. Okay, I think it's get steady state. Uh, steady, not stead. You just oh. out a Y. That's all. Yeah, that was it. No okay. get. Yeah. Yeah, it was right. No get. No get. Okay. Yeah, that's one place where there's no get. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, well, it's like simulate. It's like because it actually changed the model state as well. So what this is showing is the um, the change in the model um, when it's settled out. So zero is basically means it's not changing. So it's reached a steady state. I believe you can also do. Is it get steady state concentrations? Oh wait, here we go. Okay, I don't remember that command. Unfortunately, I forgot to include this. But I think there's there is no, a no, way. It's get, get steady. Values. Get steady. Just go get and let the thing complete for you. Uh, get steady state Eight values. Okay, there yeah, their values there. Oh, on this. Now there is an an array. There's another one that actually returns a labeled. Um, vector as well so you know what's what it's get steady, steady state, state. Uh, maybe um, like values named array or something I would think it was named the array list. or something yeah yeah okay i'll try it. let's see steady state yeah they're, yeah they're named array there you go that's the good stuff okay so here we I must be yeah. looking at wrong yeah you got it yeah it's a... uh, yeah so i'm just i'm just Saying I must have the wrong R here because oh you didn't you may not have run the oh yeah run things. oh right that's right so because I because we expect to have three values yes, here so true. that's because I didn't actually click on run this because it was already right. showing the that's thing. always a problem with Jupyter notebooks mm -hmm. so now we'll see the values okay so you see S one S two and three once they sort themselves all out they settle at these values which we see on this graph um, eight four and two and so those are that's another useful thing that you might want to check if you can. So this is checking if your model is in fact at steady state. And then this is probably the more useful of the two, um, which is what are actually those concentrations at steady state. 
are there any questions about this, these kind of little nifty tricks? Okay, so this is my last section. Um, and this is just to emphasize that you can learn, learn, use Tellurium with other languages. So a lot of times when you are going into bio models or whatever repository, uh, you get things from those models are not written in antimony. Um, they're often written in SVML or maybe cell ML. And uh, Tellurium can use both of those to run the simulations and it can also convert those things back and forth into antimony. So again, we'll take our friendly antimony string from before um, and we might wanna convert this to SVML to maybe upload it to repository or share it with someone else. Uh, and Tellurium can convert this into an SBML string just with this simple um, antimony to SBML command uh, with the antimony string included in there. And so you can see this nice human readable model of S1 to S2 gets converted into this um, SBML format, which is very difficult for a human to parse. Um, likewise, we can go back um, from SBML to antimony. So maybe you get a model from the biomodels database and you want to look at it in a way that actually you can read and figure out what's going on. So you can um, have this long unwieldy SBML string or an SBML file, and you can put the string or the path into here and the Tellurium will convert that, give you a quick conversion back into antimony. So we take this long string that just, it really, really goes on and on and it'll pop out this nice automatically generated um, antimony string in a way that we can understand what's going on with this, mo with this model. And then we can pop it in um, to, re we can also, sorry, we can also simulate it without converting it to antimony. So here, this is the same model as before. Instead of the antimony model, we're going to, instead of, sorry, loading the antimony model, we're gonna load the SBML string. So this command is, in, in lieu of um, te.loada, this is, which stands for load antimony, this is te.load SBML model. And we're gonna plug in that SBML string in from before or the path to an SBML model, um, simulate it as before and plot it. And we have a nice oscillator. Uh, so that's the end of my presentation. Um, I will, if there are any questions, I can answer them right now. Otherwise, um, I have included, let's see, four um, pretty simple little exercises here if you'd like to go through and review what was um, covered in the presentation and try it out for yourself just in these little boxes. So um, again, the link to this uh, notebook is in the chat. So um, you'll, if you just click and open that and then copy the, your own copy of it, either, um, sorry, here, file, copy, and drive, or you can download it and run it on your uh, own notebook IDE or Python IDE. Let's see. Okay. Does anyone have any questions or want to, you know, clarify something or see something again? I have a uh, kind of a broader question. Sure. I'm, uh, it's not really so much based on the, the software. Um, I'm doing a project right now with where we are looking at uh, some existing SBML models and we're looking to, we're looking to put them together essentially. Um, so we're, we're, we're uh, using cell designer right now just to kind of visualize them. And, and by the way, I'm, I'm a, uh, a novice, uh, probably relative to many folks uh, on this call, but so we're looking at using cell designer to, to uh, just get a sense for the models as we investigate, which we're going to use to piece together for this specific application. This looks really, you know, I'm more comfortable in Python. This looks like a really good way to maybe do that um, mm -hmm. and, you know, manipulate the models and then run some simulations and so on so anyway just looking for some you know thoughts from you know you or this group is this is this a good tool for that or are there yeah absolutely i would say like mm. and i could i'll cover some of this in 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 the antimony bit also but um 
One of the things that SVML and Antimony let you do is make things hierarchically. If you're if you are taking a bunch of models and like stitching them together, you can actually you could do that just by like string manipulation, like copy things and paste in and rename whatever, re rename the things that are the same to be the same and and everything else. Or but if you want to, you can also uh, actually have the equal instructions be hierarchical and say like um, whatever ATP in like this model's ATP is the same as this model's dot lowercase ATP or something or ATP five or you know or or whatever like because each model will probably have different naming conventions for the for each of the species so you can stitch things together however you like um, using hierarchy again the other option is to just sort of view everything in antimony print out the strings put them in a big editor and then just start uh, uh, deleting basically basically when you're combining models. You want to figure out what things are the same, what things are redundant, um, and what things are no longer necessary. So if you want to say like it, these two models both encode the same reaction, you say like those reactions are the same. And, and whichever one you want to use as your as your final version, you say, I want to use this one. Or maybe you say like, I don't want to use either of those. I want to use a new one that sort of takes new things into consideration. So uh, one question um, for you. Yeah. Um, is there any overlap between the models you're combining? Um, other than the species, I mean, I guess there are always overlap on species names, right? Molecule names. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but the reactions are probably unique in each one. Yes. Yes. I mean, sometimes you'll have something that, in general, is different, but like you'll they'll both have a species degradation rate or something. And if you yeah. don't notice that, it'll degrade at twice the speed that you want it to, or something. If you accidentally leave them. That's both true. In. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pulling together a, you know, a couple of cell pathways and attempting to knit them together. Right. So what I would right. do is I would convert them all to antimony and then get your favorite editor and start merging the names, you know, so you might have one name for, I mean, let's say you had a glue, let's say you had two models that contain glucose, one when one model glucose was called glucose yeah. and the other model was called gluc. Yeah. So you'd convert them both to antimony and then you'd look for glucose and gluc and decide, well, I'm going to name them both glucose. And then in that way, they are now joined at glucose. Yeah. That is exactly what I, I that's would all, That's all you have to do. Right. So just right. convert them to antimony, both of them, or however many you've got, you find your favorite editor and just start you know, merging things together. And as Lucian said, if there are any duplicate reactions, check for those just in case, if there are mm. some, you know, reactions mm. that are the same. Yeah. So that's it, really. It's just a... Sometimes a you'll have duplicate parameters also, and or uh, or different ideas oh, about what parameter values yes. are, you know? Like... That's... Well, yeah, one thing you gotta watch is uh, they may use the same parameter names for different things. In the same it's models, they two be, different models. So yeah. one model may use K1 for something, but the other model also uses K1 mm. or something So if else. you just cut and paste everything, then automatically. So you got to make sure those yeah. names are unique too. Yeah. Otherwise okay. they'll uh, step on each other. And and yeah, I can, I can, you can do that in, in uh, with, with hierarchy also as well. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I would, I would just do the merge. But just a dumb yeah. merge is the easiest way to do it. It'll, you know, it'll be a bit tedious job, but. And and then you you would we, we would be doing some various simulations, looking at uh, sort of breakpoints, robustness, uh, in 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 how this model is going to work. Yeah. Would it looks from Lillian what Lillian showed that we can model the ODEs pretty well here. Um, sure. That's, yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's that's its core design what it's yeah, supposed okay. to do so no yeah. no reason to to play around in matlab here this this is this will be able to handle it just fine okay. yeah i mean you'll be able to do anything yeah. you can do in matlab you can do it in python ex okay. except that you yeah. can distribute something that everybody can use not just matlab right people. right wonderful okay wow the cool. other thing about well, roadrunner specifically yeah is it's designed to be fast um it it acts like under the hood. It takes the SVML model, it compiles it to machine code, and then runs that machine uh, machine code on, as as though it, it you get a really significant speed up with that for anything that's really large or you want to run it for a long time or you want to run multiple runs of the same thing with different starting conditions or whatever. 
Yeah, we uh-huh. there's going to be. I think it's going to take a while. Uh, there's going to be a lot of yeah, a lot, a lot of simulation of here, unfortunately. Um, yeah, yeah. Wow, cool. That that's great. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Got it. Uh, do we want to run through the exercises ourselves also, or just give people five minutes? Or um, I mean, it depends on what people want to do. Any votes? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you all want? That means we get to decide. Ha <laughs> ha. Well, I guess I could run run through them, and if you know people want to stay on, they can. Otherwise, they can hopefully come back in a few minutes to see the antimony presentation. Uh, let's try right here. Yeah, sometimes just doing the exercise live is good. If, even if nothing else, like the mistakes you make are the same mistakes that other people will make. So <laughs> it's like you get to notice like. What the process is of of like of what the error messages look like and how to deal with things. Sure. Okay. So I'll just go through these really quick. Um, so the first type thing is we have this um, slightly you share your screen again. Oh, yep. <laughs> Zoom bingo. <laughs> Center square. Uh, let's see. I think this is nope. It's this one. Not the right one. Yeah, it looks right. Okay. <laughs> Neat. Okay, so this is so first we have exercise one, which is to take this um, antimony model right here and simulate it from zero to twenty with fifty data points. So um, go through the usual pattern that we've seen before a few times on these slides. So we'll set up a, a Roadrunner instance and load the model into there. Um, so then we can simulate this. Um, that'll work, but we do have specific times that we want to simulate. So we want to go from 0 to 20 seconds with 50 data points. So 0, 20, 50. And let's see what we have. Okay, so that works. This is our simple simulation data. The next exercise is to plot this with a title and X and Y labels. Um, so we can simply go a plot and that'll work, but it won't have the labels. So we can assign with these optional arguments um, to uh, I think it's uh, a bit label. Yep. Um, so Y label equals um, C. Type in real life. Time. Oh, sorry. It's not using them anyway. It's not using. Them. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Well, let's let's see. Let's go look at what I have before where it actually did work. Um. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's so it's title. Okay. Well, then rude because it suggested label. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. So there's a title. Title. There we go. Okay, very nice. So we'll reset the model and plot only the S2 time course. So since we haven't really changed any parameters, we can just do like this kind of soft reset. Um, let's see. Then we can again do, do the simulation. This time we only care about um, time. 
and S2. Oops. And then do I have plot for the next question? No, it's a S for plot in that one. No, no. Well, okay. Well, we will just oops, plot this guy for funsies. And we'll just use all the defaults. So here we go. We have just a nice. Yeah, okay. Yeah, there we go. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Colors confused me for a second. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so this is the time course of S2, which is orange up here. So here we go. So we'll reset the mo same model, reset it uh, again. So we're going back to time zero. Let's change the value of K1. Um, see what it is before up here. So K1 is 0.15. So let's increase it to 0 0.5. Oops. The simulation again. We'll just do the defaults this time. And plot it this time. OK, so there we go. So you can see this peaks a lot faster. This peak is around um, two seconds, whereas up here it kind of takes, it's around like three, four, I don't know. Um, so this increase in the rate constant has increased this um, conversion to S2. It um, kept oh. the same time course selections, which is interesting to me. Like you, you, you set them. Oh, well, yeah, that is interesting. I didn't. Yeah. I wasn't so expecting that. That's, <laughs> that's an interesting feature that uh, Matthias. <laughs> we have one of our big users, Matthias Koenig. He loves that. <laughs> um, so it remembers your last selection. Okay. And uh, so you have to tell it. Uh, you could probably do like uh, do a, a new load if you want. You could do a new load, and then it'll yeah. be yeah, yeah. So I have to load it again, or can I just can I do reset all or that or no no we'll no it. reset no, all doesn't reload. Mean... You do no, it has reload to it. Yeah. okay. So we will do. Um... Yeah, you just have to do that. All right, there we go. <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah, that's caught me a few times, but Matthias loves it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so those are the exercises. Um, there's about 10 minutes before, well, I don't know if Lucian wants to start early, but in any case, there's between zero and 10 minutes to win the antimony. <laughs> 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 nice. All right, should I stop that recording and then we can... Uh, sure. There's no other questions. I will go ahead and stop that. Bonk. <laughs>